Then you look at the band, and if the band is as a brown uh, background, it's in favor of melanocytic hyperplasia. And this brown background is overlaid by longitudinal bands that I will comment later. But then, if you have this brown color, it's in favor of either a nevus or melanoma, hyperplasia of melanocytes in the neural matrix. And overlying these brown bands, you have longitudinal lines. And these longitudinal lines can be either regular or irregular. And it's like everywhere. Irregularity is in favor of melanoma, and regularity is in favor of nevus. So it's very simple. If the bands are regular in size, shape, coloration, spacing, it's in favor of a nevus. Again, the color is not important. This is a very fair uh, nevus, and this was a very uh, dark nevus. But what is important is that the lines are regular in their thickness, uh, in their spacing, and in their coloration. The color depends on the skin color of the patient. This is a nail nevus of a dark skin patient, and this was a, a nevus in a light skin patient. If then we have an irregular pattern of the lines, it's in favor of melanoma. The lines are irregular in their coloration, in their spacing, in their parallelism. I must say that parallelism is a very difficult word to say for a French guy. So I'm sorry, uh, parallelism. I need to train a little to, to say that. Um, and then you have changes in color and spacing. And this is a typical case of melanoma. Of course, it's too much. And if you want to see earlier lesion, it will not look as beautiful as this case. But you see that the lines are different in color, in spacing, in, in the thickness. And some areas of parallelism disruption are seen. Then if the background is not brown, but grayish, it's in favor of any disease without significant melanocytic hyperplasia in the nail matrix. You see? It's, the color is different, it's grayish. And when it's grayish, very few melanocytes are present in the nail matrix. And this is seen in many conditions. Most of the commonest co uh, conditions you see on the nail, Lantiger, ethnic type pigmentation, lentiginosis, especially Logier Itzika disease, drug-induced pigmentation, and repetitive trauma-induced nail pigmentation. Micro etching sun sign is a very rare symptom, but when it's observed, it's defined by the presence of pigment in the cuticle or in the subangual uh, skin that is not visible clinically, and this is in favor of melanoma, but it's, it's extremely rare. So you cannot rely on this symptom to make the diagnosis of early melanoma. But when it's present, then it's very highly in favor. Looking at less pigmented tumors, we need to, uh, to say that white bands, yellow bands, but especially hyperkeratosis underneath the nail plate are in favor of epithelial tumors of the nail matrix. And these epithelial tumors are onychomatricoma, onychopapilloma, and squamous cell carcinoma. And very often, what you see is this uh, thickened nail plate with something underlying the nail plate like this, and very often purpuric spots there. And you can see also that some vessels are thrombotized and that the band is yellowish, whitish, but could be black also in Bowen's disease. So you see it's very highly in favor of squamous cell carcinoma or onychomatricoma, and then you, it's a good symptom also. Hemorrhages are also very common in nail, of course, you know that uh, splinter hemorrhage are a good sign for scleroderma, but usually you find that on many nails. It's also a good sign for onychotillomania, but then you can see that on all the nail surface. But if you have this bleeding coming from one spot of the matrix, but without involvement of the rest of the nail, then you can think that you have a tumor in this region. It's observed in onychomatricoma, in squamous cell carcinoma, but also in uh, amelanotic malignant melanoma. So then you know the symptoms, so you have to make the final diagnosis. And the final diagnosis could be 
pigmented melanoma. And in that case, it's quite easy when it's simple. When it's, uh, it's uh, a, a typical case, you have a brown background and you have irregular pattern of the lines. So this is another case with a very important pigmentation of the periangual skin, but you see that the bands are irregular. This is another case without involvement of the periangual skin, but irregular pattern of the lines. But be careful. Always use your dermoscope. This patient looks not so frightening. Huh? Would you perform a biopsy for this lesion? No. But if you use dermoscopy, you will see that there are many lines. And these lines are irregular in their pigmentation, in their spacing, in their uh, um, uh, thickness. And this was melanoma. So always use your dermoscope to look at the patient. Melanocytic nevus is opposed to that with a regular pattern, and we have seen many images of that, so not so difficult. And in our view now, it's not necessary to take a biopsy of these lesions. We can save the patient's hands and toes and not perform painful surgery. Subhangual hemorrhages, the key sign are blood spots, but you have to be very stringent on one point the absence of any other symptom, and second, to see this patient after some time to be sure that nothing was hidden underneath the pigmentation. So you see this is a subangual hemorrhage. You see that the proximal hand is roundish. You see that the distal hand is filamentous, but you see nothing there. So there could be a squamous cell carcinoma, for example. So you have to see this patient after six months to be sure that nothing was there. And again, be stringent on the other point. This patient has subangual hemorrhage, for sure. But he also has melanoma. You see the lines. So melanoma is often bleeding. And having this lesion does not rule out the diagnosis of melanoma. So always use your dermoscope when you look at a uh, nail. By the way, I forgot to say that polarizing light uh, uh, dermoscopy is not very efficient to look at the nail. It's much better with immersion. And when you go to immersion, you need to have a jellified solution because uh, water is not, um, is not enough. Lantigo, lantiginosis, it's gray lines like this, but it's also the case for drug-induced pigmentation. It's also the case for ethnic type pigmentation. It's always grayish, longitudinal line, without this brown coloration and without irregularity in the lines. And a very common feature is repetitive trauma-induced pigmentation, especially on the toenails and especially in females because they like to put square in triangles <laughs> and it doesn't fit. So, uh, I just have to have a look. So look at these feet there. Could you show? So usually a normal foot doesn't fit in such boots. So you will have to create that kind of thing. It's due to uh, chronic trauma induced by the, by the boots, and it's very common in females. So it's grayish, and there is nothing to worry about. What you see here is nail lacquer that is not uh, removed. Because you know something? Not only they come with very narrow boots, but they come with nail lacquer, just to have their nail examined. So we need to have something to remove it, and I don't remove it very well, because I'm not trained to that. Bowen's disease is a difficult diagnosis in, in some cases, but you see, it's often polychromatic. We have red, white, gray, uh, and we have this triangular uh, erosion. We have uh, hyperkeratosis underneath the nail plate, and this helps to make the diagnosis of Bowen's disease. Onychomatricoma shares exactly the same features with uh, squamous cell carcinoma or Bowen's disease. The only sign you can rely on is the sharp demarcation between the involved nail plate and the uninvolved nail plate. And this very sharp demarcation that you can also see clinically is in favor of onychomatricoma as opposed to squamous cell carcinoma and Bowen's disease. Of course, you may like to localize precisely the pigment. And to localize precisely the pigment is interesting since 
we know that uh, the uh, proximal matrix builds the dorsum of the nail plate, and that the distal matrix builds the underneath portion, portion of the nail plate. It means that if you take a biopsy in this area, you will not create so much of a scar. But if you take a biopsy of this area on the proximal matrix, you will change dramatically the surface of the nail and you will change the shape of the nail. So to know where the pigment comes from could be interesting to uh, explain to the patient that the scar is going to be ugly or the scar is going to be acceptable. And it's easy. If you look at the edge of the nail plate, if you see that the pigment is in the lower part of the nail plate, it means that it comes from the distal matrix and that the scar is not going to be so ugly. But if it comes that the lesion is located in the upper part of the nail plate, then you know that it comes from the proximal matrix and that the uh, surgery is going to create an ugly scar. So this is a demonstration. You can see that in this case, the pigmentation is underneath the nail plate. It, it says clearly that it comes from the distal matrix. And this is uh, another way to show that. You do a nail clipping with the Fontana Masson stain, and you see that the, the pigment is located underneath the nail plate. Of course, there are doubtful cases. And in some cases, you don't want to go directly to the biopsy. So you can do exactly the same you do on skin. You know that on regular skin, in case of unsuspicious lesions with high-risk patients, this patient already had three melanomas and has a CDKN2 uh, mutation. We followed many lesions, and this lesion was melanoma. It was melanoma there, but we didn't know. It's, a, it's melanoma there, and it's proven because it's changed. The same figure applies to the, to the nail but it's much longer. So this was a case I showed you already. The lesion was not clearly in favor of melanoma, even though I can accept the idea that this pattern of the lines were, was not very regular. So maybe we could have done the diagnosis earlier. But I must say it's not so important. It took one year and a half to observe this change. And in one year and a half, we obtained just a 0.19 uh, 18 millimeters melanoma. So we have plenty of time to make this diagnosis. And in my view, it's interesting in case of doubtful cases to wait a little to be sure that we are performing biopsies in the right cases. This is another case. We changed after two years. And this is another case with early changes because we have also this strategy with early uh, comparison and late comparison. This patient was seen after three months, and you see that there is dramatic in, uh, increase in the size of the band. The scale is the same. The aspect is benign. You have a regular pattern of the lines. But since it enlarged dramatically within only three months, it was in us to take the biopsy, and this was in situ melanoma. So digital follow-up could be interesting. And it's interesting in other conditions. It's easy to make the diagnosis of onychomycosis in this case because you see it comes from the lateral fold and not from the matrix. So we have a doubt that it could be anything serious. And of course, the treatment cleared the lesion. So we propose this scheme. At first evaluation, you can see either an atypical lesion, and in that case, surgical biopsy has to be performed immediately. If it's subungual hemorrhage, if it clears after four or six months, then it's the end of the story. But if it's not changing, surgical biopsy could be performed. And if it's non-atypical, since nail pigmentation is not such a common feature, it's better to, uh, to have a follow-up of these patients, to see the patient after four months. If it's changing, you can take a biopsy. And then if after four months we see no change, a yearly follow-up could be enough to pick up the few melanomas that you miss at first examinations. 